So why would a scientist make a green glowing cat? Maybe the more germane question is, has a scientist already made a green glowing cat? Do you know the answer? If, if a scientist has made a green glowing cat, what earthly good will it do us? You know, well, those of you that watch the intellectually stimulating television might remember Sheldon's glowing fish nightlight on the Big Bang Theory. Did you see that one? Now, that's great that the technology I'm going to tell you about today is sometimes parodied in the media. I enjoy it. I think it's really funny. But scientists come off in the media quite often as being just a little bit mad. And that's something that I want to strive to work against a little bit. So while, while you might say, oh, the thing on the slide there is just a product of me working with Photoshop and coloring a kitty cat green, I'm going to tell you that the cat really does exist and that scientists aren't necessarily mad for making it. The Nobel Prize Committee in 2008 thought the scientists were perfectly justified in making organisms that were bright green and fluorescent. They awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry to the people that were instrumental in discovering the technology and in learning how to use it to make fluorescent animals. And since the technology has been discovered, a whole host of different animal species have been converted so that they glow in the dark, essentially. Right from bacteria, which were the first organism that was, that was created, all the way up through fruit flies, our little experimental fly organisms, right up and through to the mammals. So mice, of course, mice have been converted so that now they glow in the dark. They're fluorescent and green. Pigs, yes, the cat is real. The monkeys, the monkeys that you see on the right of the picture. I've got to say something about the green. It's relatively benign. Nobody yet has demonstrated that the technique that we use to make these animals glow in the dark causes them any harm at all. And in fact, if you saw the monkeys there in normal daylight, you wouldn't see the green. They look indistinguishable from their siblings who aren't transformed to be green and fluorescent. It's only when they're illuminated with lasers or with a certain specific wavelength of light that all of a sudden the green comes glowing through. Now, okay, we've made it up to monkeys. We haven't yet made any glowing green human beings. I get lots of volunteers from my undergraduates when I teach about this every year. Lots of people think it would be great to be down in the club and be fluorescent and green. Uh, ethical considerations mean that we're not allowed to do those sorts of experiments on human beings yet. But that being said, the picture in the middle are human cancer cells in culture. And they are green and fluorescent. And in fact, there's a little bit of red fluorescence in there as well that's done with the same technique I'm going to tell you about. So we're looking at human cells, which means in principle, these same techniques that are applied to cats and pigs and monkeys could be applied to human beings. It still doesn't answer why a scientist would want to do this. Let's talk about genes. We all have genes. All living organisms have genes. You and I, as human beings, have somewhere between 20 and 25,000 genes. Genes determine everything about who we are. All of the traits, the way we look, are determined by genes. There's a little bit of an environmental input, but the environment is just working on the genetic sort of component that is you. So our genes, genes are scattered throughout our chromosomes. So within every single cell in your body, you've got chromosomes. You've got 23 of them, two pairs of 23 for 46, if you're keeping score. 23 chromosomes lined with genes. Each gene codes for a protein. Proteins are the big molecules that do all of the work of life. So in your cells right now, your proteins are doing the work that's keeping you alive. The technique that I'm talking about for making an animal glow is called green fluorescent protein technology. And by the way, that's one of my favorite stories in biology. I say to my students sometimes, now you're a smart scientist, right? You discover a protein that's green and fluorescent. What would you call it? And I get back silence. People are thinking of these great big long chemical names like you see on the back of the shampoo bottles in the morning. No, the people that discovered it called it green fluorescent protein. And in fact, the man that discovered it, he was called Osamu Shimamura. He was one of those Nobel Prize laureates. He first noticed that this jellyfish protein glowed in the dark. 
We still don't know why this particular species of jellyfish has a protein that glows in the dark. Lots of people are engaged in thinking about what the protein might be for in the real world. But Shimamura, anyway, harvested a lot of jellyfish, and I suspect in a not very sustainable way, and he collected a lot of the protein. It wasn't until 30 years passed, it wasn't until the mid-1990s that people were able to find the gene that carried the genetic code for that protein in the jellyfish. And that's just because the technology wasn't there through the 1960s and 1970s, even the 1980s, to do this sort of thing. So by the 90s, people started looking into the jellyfish, and they found out that, indeed, there is a gene. The second Nobel Prize laureate is called Martin Chalfie. And he figured out how to take the gene from the jellyfish and put it into another organism. The organism wasn't the cat. We're not there yet. The organism was a bacterium. And the amazing and beautiful thing about life and evolution is that when the gene was moved from the jellyfish into this single-celled organism, the single-celled organism lit up and was as fluorescent as the jellyfish is. Now, isn't that fantastic? So, there's a second Nobel Prize laureate. The third Nobel Prize laureate, by the way, is called Roger Chen. And his lab did something really good. His lab figured out how to take the protein and alter its structure ever so slightly so that the color that it yields changes. And if you look down the right-hand side of the slide, you'll see the beautiful, beautiful artist palette that cell biologists like myself have to work with every day now. I can put any fluorescent color I want into a cell. How do we do this? Somebody that does my sort of work is called a molecular biologist. And a molecular biologist simply goes into the DNA of the target organism. I decide, you know, what organism is it that I want to work on? It might be a fruit fly. And I want to make the fruit fly fluorescent. So I target their DNA. That's a stretch of DNA in the slide. And I cut it open. And I take the bit of DNA that is the gene from the jellyfish that codes for the fluorescent protein. And I put it into the fruit fly's DNA. Then, in the adult fruit fly, the gene is expressed, and the little GFP, the green fluorescent proteins, float out into the cell, and the cell becomes fluorescent. So there's a picture. In fact, this is a human cell in the picture. We've got not only green fluorescent protein marking a structure in the cell called the microtubule cytoskeleton, we also have a red version of fluorescent protein marking the mitochondria, which are the little energy organelles within the cell. Why did the Nobel Prize Committee decide that this was worth an award? I mean, Nobel Prizes are given to things that are significant, things that could potentially change the world. So, this has changed the world. This has completely changed the way that biology, in particular cell biology, is done. Pre-GFP, a biologist like myself would kill a cell using a chemical called a fixative, and then stain it, put it on a microscope slide, look at it through a microscope. But the thing is, we were looking at a dead cell, and that was okay as far as it went. That let, that let the classical biologist determine what all of the different things inside cells were. But it didn't let us look at living cells. The fantastic thing about green fluorescent protein is that it's made inside of living cells. I can put living cells on my laser microscope, and I can activate that fluorescence, and I can watch life happening right before my eyes. I liken this, by the way, to being in a drone or even higher in a satellite, Google Earth, and looking down on a city. You would see all of the things moving around in the city. And that would help you much better understand how a city works. So I understand much, much more now about how cells work by using this technology. OK, that's how you make organisms glow. So far, so far, I've told you how we do it but still not what good it's going to do us. Here's an example. Making a fluorescent cat is what I see as a proof of concept technique. And this is what it's been used for, famously. It's a proof of concept of a technique that we would call gene therapy. Now let's say that you, or somebody you know, suffers from a genetic disease. A genetic disease is one that you have because you've inherited a gene that's faulty. It's probably mutated in its sequence so that the protein that it codes for doesn't do its proper job inside of the cell. Gene therapy says, no problem. If we can get gene therapy working, all we need to do is replace the faulty gene in every one of your cells with a good copy of the gene. 
So it sounds fairly straightforward. The good copy of the gene would make the proper version of the protein problem solved. Is this workable in practice? The first hurdle you have to overcome is, can you transform every single cell in an organism? Remember the picture of the glowing green kitty cat? Here he is. That's proof that you can transform every single cell in the organism. And the great thing about GFP technology is it's really quick to score. I just look at the little developing cat embryo and I can see that every single one of its cells has been transformed with the jellyfish gene. Now let's say the cat suffered from a genetic disease or there was a disease of cats that we wanted to cure. Well, we could do that using this technique. In this case, we wouldn't put the green fluorescent protein gene in, we would put a gene in that makes a protein that helps fight disease. This is a real example. This cat, or one like it, at the Mayo Clinic has been cured, or is much more resistant, at least, to the feline version of AIDS. These cat cells are much more resistant to the feline immunodeficiency virus because of the insertion of a single gene. The GFP technology let us, let us see that the technique works, and we moved on then and have started doing gene therapy. That's great. What I've been telling you about is medicine. I teach a lot of undergraduate pre-med students. I've taught hundreds of them over the years. All of those people are going to go out as medical professionals. They're going to solve all sorts of medical problems. The upshot of that is that we're all going to live longer. Let's change tack a little bit here, okay? Here's a graph. If you just look at the green, I mean, it's a pretty boring looking graph. I accept that. Look at the green line. The green line is the amount of arable, in other words, the amount of agricultural land that we have available to grow plants on. And you'll see that this is a projection running from 1990 out to the year 2050. The amount of arable land doesn't change, does it? In fact, if you look at the little dotty line, the amount of arable land is probably going to go down. As, as the population grows, we need to build houses for people to live in. That will go on arable land. Uh, climate change will probably result in the loss of farmland. So in fact, if anything, in the next 33 years, the amount of arable land on Earth is going to go down. That's the land we grow our food on. Here's what happens when you superimpose population growth on top of that. Population, right this minute, is 7.5 billion individuals on this sorry planet. The planet's going to be a lot sorrier by 2050 with conservatively 9.5 billion. So we're going to add 2 billion. Some people say we're going to add 3 billion more people. How do we solve that difference? How do we feed 3 billion more people with the limited farmland resources that we have? The answer, of course, is to use the technology that I've been talking about in a sustainability context. That's a picture of a plant. And the plant, of course, is completely transformable using the technology that I've been talking about. So that plant is expressing the jellyfish gene in every single one of its cells. Plants can be altered using the same techniques so that they're more efficient producers of food. And that's what people that do plant cell biology, like myself, are engaged in doing. Let me tell you a story. I'm going to tell you the story about golden rice, because it really, really exemplifies the issue that I'm speaking about today. Golden rice is an idea that came about in the early 1980s, before we even had the techniques for doing the gene transformations that I'm talking about. A lot of people in Southeast Asia millions of people in Southeast Asia and Africa have rice as their sole or their main food source. The problem with rice is that it itself is vitamin A deficient. That means that rice doesn't make enough vitamin A and people that eat rice eventually become vitamin A deprived and malnourished. This results in, listen to this, between one and two million deaths a year. 607,000 children per year die of vitamin A deficiency in these regions, and another half million go blind. So the people that came up with the golden rice idea said, let's put genes into rice that means that the rice plant itself is more nutritious. It can make vitamin A. Took a gene from a daffodil and a gene from a bacterium put it into rice, made golden rice. The first version of golden rice in the late 1990s was perfect. It produced vitamin A in quantities sufficient to keep people well nourished. The latest version of golden rice, golden rice V2, or Mark II, produces 23 times the amount of vitamin A 
of wild type rice. So this is a success story. This technology will reduce the death rate uh, due to malnutrition, and it will also solve blindness problem in young children. So that's one story. Let me finish by talking in general about using the technology, genetic modification, to make plants more efficient producers, higher yielding. Because we've got the limited amount of farmland that I talked about, that's not going to increase. The number of people is greatly going to increase. So we need to make each individual plant that we grow nowadays much, much more yielding so that we have more food in a sense. In the photo on the screen, we've got an ear of maize that suffered a pathogen attack. It's going to rot on the plant or on the ground or somewhere, and it's not going to be available as animal food or as human food. The one on the right has been modified with the insertion of a single gene so that it's now pathogen resistant. Wow, if we can roll out that technology, how fantastic. So the technology has been rolled out in many countries. Uh, an estimate in 2015 said that pathogen-resistant corn has, has seen, pathogen-resistant crops in general, I'm sorry, has seen a 15% yield increase already. Global warming is going to cause all sorts of other environmental problems. It's going to cause heat stress, drought stress, and salinity stress for plants. We can also genetically modify plants so that they survive all of these sorts of stresses so we can keep producing at at least the levels that we're seeing today. You know, we haven't really seen the results of the coming food crisis here in the first world. You get kind of irritated, don't you, when you go into your local supermarket and the price of bread has gone up by a little bit. People that think about these sorts of things say wars will be fought by 2050 because people will be starving. So we've really, really got to embrace this technology. Last thing I'll say is about the issues surrounding the technology, just quickly. A lot of these technologies haven't been deployed as much as they could have been already, in particular the golden rice technology. It's tested, it works really well, it's not being grown commercially, and that's because there are a lot of concerns and controversies surrounding the use of genetically modified organisms. All I'm going to say is, Scientists are basically trustworthy people. The people that work on this are people that are concerned with the state of our planet and especially going forward. We don't take extremist viewpoints. I don't say genetic modification is the most wonderful thing since sliced bread. I also don't say genetic modification is evil. I want to study genetic modification on a case-by-case -case basis and where we see yield gains, I want to roll it out immediately so we can solve this coming crisis. And that, by the way, is why a scientist might make a glowing green cat. Thank you.